let me commence this interesting musings, which is really a, an anthology based on three stories on dogs, fishes, and stains. So what's this? This is an interesting anthology, as I mentioned, of three stories. And all these tie into smart assurance. So maybe you have some idea as to where these three things come in and how it'll be interesting to see how we kind of tie it up. So let's start with the story number one, the dog story. I don't know how many of you like dogs, but I love them. I'm quite sure a lot of us like them. But yeah, we are afraid sometimes because they bite. But do you know, if you own a dog, I'm sure you know, do you otherwise know that the coat, the dog's coat is infested with parasites? And that's a real pain if you are a dog owner. You know that. You know why? Because they come off the coat and then they are sitting in your house and they climb the walls and so on. So the, the, the question here for the story is about how to remove them. Remove what? The parasites on the coat. So before we jump along, what do I do? How, because I've been owning a dog for many years until, of course, the last, the fellow passed away about a year ago. After that, I probably not, I just pet other dogs. But then, every time when I used to give, when I used to uh, look at this dog and do something with removal, it was always reminded me of testing. And I think I wrote an article about it many, many years ago. So first, the question I ask is, hey, what parasites are there on the skin of the dog or the coat of the dog? And if you do the research and you obviously learn it from experience that there are two kinds. One is stick and another is flea. Tick is, uh, you know, the, the, the slightly bigger one, you know, and uh, it sucks up blood, becomes fat and falls off and climbs the walls. Fleas are really tiny and fleas are amazingly interesting part of weight ratio because they can, they are so tiny, but they can jump quite a few feet. So you understand that they're extremely small legs. So they travel quite a bit by just flying. And why am I saying that? Each of them are different. And therefore the question is, if I don't know what parasites, how would I probe for them? And what kind of probe would I use? Yeah, one of the simplest stuff is to use a brush, maybe a metal brush. So that when you brush the coat, maybe if it's a hairy dog especially, it, hopefully the brush catches those parasites and you can physically remove them. Of course, if the dog is not a hairy dog, then the, the parasites are also comparatively lesser. But they're there, they're there in different places as we shall see. The second way is to do the tweezer. So you take a tweezer and then you search for them and pull it, bad idea because it is it tears the skin. Not the best of the idea. And messes up the skin and you know obviously causes irritation to the dog. The third one is probably the most preferred, give a bath or apply some medication on the skin or the coat or inject uh, you know some medicine into the bloodstream and make these guys fall off. So all these are related to medication. Three different ways of probing for these issues to remove them, right? First, first, right? Second really is to ask. So I'm not just randomly doing this exercise because I want to be sure that I can remove these parasites as much as possible, as quickly as possible so that the dog can live comfortably. And hopefully my house is not less infested with these parasites. So the next is where do I look for them? Typically, if you go and do a bit of a research, which I, if you have a dog, you will know is they are not always sitting on the top of the skin, which is exposed. They're certainly there on certain places, like just how bugs in software, we claim it congregates in places. So they're normally in non-exposed areas, like the, the under part of the ear, because if the ear is you know, flappy and it falls, or it's in moist places, uh, like you know the legs where it connects to the abdomen, they're moist. Or they're probably under, you know, in the, in the, uh, in between the digits of uh, the feet. So you kind of get to know, ask where they are so that you can become smarter in finding them. And lastly, or thirdly, how do you go about? It? How's the approach? How do I perturb these fellows so that I can make them follow away? 
One way, as we talked about this, if I use a brush as a probe, I will brush it by parting the skin, by brushing it. Or maybe um, I will part it and then take use the tweezer or I would give it a bath or I would apply a medicine. So all these are actions. Probes are the means and perturbation is the action. And what we really want to know at the end is how do I know if it's done well? So the question that when I, when I used to give a bath to the dog, which is approximately every three weeks, it used to be one of those fascinating exercises every time, simply because uh, we're all testers, right? So we always ask, how do I know I've done it well? How do I know that I have removed? And we really don't know how many ticks and fleas are there. And it's seasonal. Certain season cause it to multiply much more. And it also, and then you ask the question, where do they come from? And then you realize, yeah, if I take dog for a long walk, in the typical neighborhood where we live, there are a lot of stray dogs and the neighborhood is infested. The outside is infested with ticks and they are normally picked up by the dogs. And, and then they multiply in the bloodstream, right? I mean, in the, in the, in the coat, sorry. So the, the idea here is, is, is it done well means, how do I know before I do the job that I'm going to do well? How do I know that just about while I'm doing the job that I am doing well. And then later that I have done well, so I'm confident enough to say, ha, the dog is, is less troubled. Or in the case of a software, you can apply it and say, look, how do I know what I'm going to do is going to be effective? How do I know that I am doing effectively? And later, how do I know that I can be confident that it's done well so that I can be confident of, of uh, something in the field, right? So that's the question that we have. So. The dog story was kind of trying to illustrate the idea that looking at the physical notion of bugs, uh, the simple action seemed to be, you know, knowing what, knowing where to look, and knowing how to go about, and knowing if you're doing it well, seems to be an iterative approach. And therefore, if I have these kinds of thought processes, then I can start with a goal, refine, adjust, iterate, the goal and therefore do it as rapidly as I can, as intelligently as I can, and therefore, mm, in this case, you know, find bugs. And if I come, if I come to know that I have to be careful of where I walk the dog, then I can start looking at preventing or preempting bugs, right? So that's that what I was trying to illustrate with this story. Let's move on to the next one, which is about fishes. We all know that, let's assume, of course, a lovely picture that I picked up from Canada, not necessarily the representative of a fisherman here. The fisherman is uh, not very rich. So let's assume it's a poor fisherman. The picture seems to indicate otherwise. And let's say the fisherman, therefore the poor fisherman needs a good catch every day for his daily survival. And, and let's assume that he fishes in the same lake for a limited time because he can't fish the whole 24 hours. After which he goes to the market and sells it and makes his money question that he should be asking is how do I ensure a good catch and that's the story about so kind of similar to the dog one right and that's really what it is but before you ask you're really asking what fishes and the reason is why because I want to know which gives me better returns because I'm spending four or five hours fishing for example a day or whatever is the amount of time I want to catch those fishes that give me a better yield, right? So I need to know which fishes are probably in demand in the market at this time. And if that particular lake has those fishes, then I would probably want to look for them. So understanding the value is important here because then I can focus on the job much better. And it also gives me a better picture, therefore, to know, okay, which are those issues, which are those fishes that I'm going to go after? Because there are probably many kinds of fishes in the lake or rather aquatic animals, to put it better, because you need not be fishes. You can be fishes and eels and crabs also, right? And then, of course, you ask, okay, now that they ideally have set men, these are the things that they need to catch. Then obviously the second question, which is similar to what we saw, is where do we look for? Is it, you know, do I catch it in the surface area? Do I go to the deep depths of the lake? Or should I be in the periphery or should I be away from the periphery? So which areas of the lake are probable areas where my yield would be higher, right? In a very similar way is what we ask also in the context of software, right? It's, we don't know where it is, but you're trying to kind of figure out 
which are these areas which are unstable, which are these areas that might be, and we use various heuristics to figure that out, right? Knowing uh, how, how detailed the requirement was, knowing how many changes were incorporated during the time, knowing the background of the person who's developing or coding, uh, knowing the pressure that we are in gives us some indications as the probability of, uh, you know, who and what kind of bugs. And that's very similar to what this is. Thirdly, the next question that you really ask is, okay, the third, how do you go about it? So here it's about saying, what kind of net? Should I have a deep one, broad one? What kind of holes? How big? Yeah, or is it a rod? And if it's a rod, do I need some special bait? How do we attract the bug to me? And that's really what the, how to go about it. And therefore, you're really looking at it from, you know, how do I perturb the system such that I have a good chance? In the dog story, we were looking at it from focusing on, I wouldn't say focus, we just started off with obviously much like here, the fishes or types. That's really figuring out the probes, right? And then finally, same question. How do I know that if it's done well before I catch, what should I do to ensure that my catch today is hopefully more successful, is successful, enough for the day, good for the day. And then while I'm doing, how do I know that I'm making good progress? I'm doing a good job. And certainly later time, I go to the market, I'm happy with the money that I made, right? And that's always the question of done well is a priori now and later. And let's now move on to the third story. Stains. Dagacha is what I guess uh, sort of says in the Indian advertisements. And we know the stains are a pain on clothes, especially when the background is conducive. So if you have one of these brilliant white shirts, and then if I do have, let's say, a fountain pen which leaks and which I put it in the front pocket, well, you know, that stain beautifully shows up in my front pocket because the background is very conducive. So stains seem to be a pain, especially in clothes, and we generally don't like stains, right? Yeah. But then, think of it slightly differently. Think of it as a heat map. Stains are heat maps, different colors, and to represent different pieces of information. And if that was now seen as a heat map, then suddenly the stains become interesting because it can depict rich information, which I can use to visualize coverage and progress and quality, which is really about how good are my probes and how effective is my act of perturbation. Perturbation is basically disturbing. The act of doing it, probe is crudely what you call as test cases, but it's beyond the test cases and scenarios and so on. Probe is the method that you use to go ahead, um, yeah, the stuff that they use, and, and perturbation is the act itself, right? So we're trying to kind of look at it from, you know, are stains interesting? Let's look at different ways of using stains. Now, there is a picture of uh, a, a more organized stain so that it's easy for me to explain it to you. So there are different sizes and maybe different colors, as you can see. So if these little interesting individual circles represent parts of your software, maybe they are features or modules or flows or subsystems or whatever you may call. And if I depict them in a bar, in a circle, which is inside, what, is it, what does the area and the color tell me? The area kind of tells me maybe, oh, I've done it uh, so much percentage. So I have covered that particular module maybe 80%. That means some things are yet to be tested. And the area could represent the, you know, how much I've done and how much is yet to be done. And it could be now, could be yesterday, it could be tomorrow, and you could actually depict it as, as a timeline series to show progress, coverage, but. And then the color, color could give us an indication of, uh, you know, how clean it is. If it's pure white, then you might say it's all brilliant and clean or green if, it, if you like. If it's red or something of that sort, then you'd say, oh, this is really buggy. So color could be an indication of giving you. So a visualization here, which is based on size and the color, looks like a bunch of stains in this picture, so to speak, gives us an area of a map of areas covered and how well. And by the way, I could apply this kind of a thinking 
part of my earlier review too, so that I can get an idea how well do you think I am, how well do I think I am covering? And then I can apply it now and I can apply it in the future after I finish too, right? When I do that in the finish, it becomes the quality of the product. That's like this. So here is a little more blurry image just to give you an idea that the whole circle now, uh, I've taken it, I've fused it together. And what does this color represent? Yeah, it's, it looks like a lovely painting, but truly it's a heat map if a way. You can do it much better. Of what? We choose to visualize quality. So you might say red are areas which are bad and orange which are okay and white which are brilliant, blue is reasonably okay and so on. Some visualization. Of course, I've taken the liberty to just put it much more creatively, but I'm sure there are better statistical tools to display it much more meaningfully. But then, what was the first one? Which areas we covered and how it was. Second, we're just talking about as a product, as an application, how does it look like? Is it uh, beautifully green? Is it, you know, terribly red? Or is it a mixture of interesting colors? How does the rainbow look, right? And therefore, it's an indication of visualization of quality. The previous one was visualization of coverage. And if I fuse the first one and second one over two, uh, over a timeline period, then I will look at activity. So yesterday, this is how it was. Today, it is like this. Day before yesterday, it was like that. So I can actually map. And this progress gives us, I mean, this kind of a timeline progress helps us visualize the activity and outcomes over time and the activity could be how is my coverage yeah, am i improving last sprint to this sprint how is the heat map is it getting any better is it getting more greener or whiter and therefore that's about but what we normally do is the most plain stuff right we normally do the simpler stuff which is uh, put that bugs over time but bugs over time are nice one way of indication we put density sometimes and sometimes we use a lot of gut feel. I'm not saying gut feels are useless, terribly useful as gut feels, but these are ways to supplement, give it a little more factual stuff. So heat maps are a much better way. And if you knew, if you knew what issues we're looking for, what issues that matter, and then if you are using it from that perspective, these heat maps become much more meaningful, right? In whatever sense. So we talked about three stories, right? We talked about one, the dog, second, the fishes, and third, the stains. So let's kind of put them all together. Let's summarize what we do and connect these stories to the what we just summarized in the context of assurance. Now, what do we really do? I think we do four things most of the time in some sequence. We try to prevent by doing better reviews, discussions, questions as much as possible. That's one kind of an activity. We want to prevent issues, right? So, and second, what we do is we try to preempt and prevent and preempt. I'm just distinguishing prevent is something that I know as to what is going to happen. Preempt is I don't know, but I'm hypothesizing. So both these are uh, pre-code, right? That means before you end up writing a code or modifying a code, you're thinking through what could I, what could go wrong? And that you do it by a variety of different ways. You do it because uh, you, you do it via reviews, discussions, playing around, et cetera. And then you do the other ones, which is detection, which is finding new issues and checking, which is basically finding if the existing ones have been broken, which is more often regression, as you say. So if you consider this as test, this is retest. Detection is test. So that is postcode. So you can only do that maybe more often than not, only when you get the code. So these are the four things that we do in pre-code side and post-code side. So now let's, let's try to start connecting some of these ideas and say, okay, remember we talked about the fact that, hey, oops, we said, hey, Maybe a good idea before we do any of these jobs to kind of set an idea and say, what issues, by the way? What is it? Ticks of fleas? What kinds of fishes? That seems to be the central notion to give us a better idea to go. And that's where some notion of hypothesis and scientific thinking comes into picture. Second, okay, I want to look for these issues maybe. 
Some I know by experience, some I know by hypotheses, some I know from past customers and past customer data. And then I really ask in what entities, where could they be? You know, under the years, beneath the, you know, at the uh, lake bed, things like those, right? So basically what modules, what features, what flows. And then you really ask, you know, which environments? Now, if you know that, you know, the dog lives in a flea invested in, invest, you know, uh, infested environment, then it's more harder. If you've got five other dogs, which are stray dogs, which also live with the dog, then you know it's going to be more interesting. If the dog lives in a very beautiful, secluded, you know, controlled environment, then you know it's, you know, it's lesser. So you know that environments matter. And if you know that, what kind of food the dog eats it also matters to whether the fleas and ticks get produced. Similarly, if you know that the lake, if it's if it's you know it's it's is 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 um, is not a very healthy lake, then you know there are less fishes. So environment matters. So you know what issues, what entities, and which environment, and then you ask, okay, how do I catch? So like what we talked about is it brushing, parting putting a net, using a rod, using a bait. And finally, the last question that we always ask, how well? And try to connect this into a picture and then saying, okay, these to the act of prevention, preemption, detection, check, which can be done pre or post. These are five things we do in a very repeated fashion to help us be clear and then do the corresponding activities that we want to do. So the how to do gives you an approach and design. And as you explore, as you start doing the job, when you explore, you understand better about what more issues, what other entities, and so on and so forth. And, and yeah, you get a better understand. So it's a very iterative process, right? So nothing is static. And that's where the context comes into picture. Now, where does the connection happen? The dogs, to me, were more to sharpen the idea of probes, the ticks and the fleas and what else. Whereas the net was to me was a, a, an idea which was more about perturbation. Do I use a big one, sharp one, broad one, shallow one, rod, bait? How do I perturb? Of course, I need a probe and I need to perturb. Perturbation action, right? Perturbation is stuff that you use. And then finally, the idea of done well is the visualization and the, therefore the stains. And that's how. I kind of try to relate to the three stories to smarter assurance. Thank you for listening.